So most of it comes from the surface. You've got less mixing, you get less oxygen, you get the spread of these anoxic zones. So animals can't respire. And that's just another issue. And you get dead zones in the ocean. And that is something that is only going to continue to increase in terms of its intensity until we properly reverse, you know, the warming of the planet. Thank you for viewing the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider liking and subscribing if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're just listening, rating the podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Please enjoy today's episode, and thanks for tuning in. Okay, so hello and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm excited to be speaking with Leo Richards from Natural World Facts. His channel offers incredible documentaries on a range of subjects spanning the natural world and with a focus on marine life. Starting when Leo was only eight years old, he has consistently produced videos for over a decade, which are now among the most comprehensive and high, highest production quality videos available on these topics anywhere online. Uh, Leo and I have been planning this conversation for a while. And again, Leo, it's a pleasure to finally get the chance to speak. So thanks for coming on. So I obviously know quite a bit about your background just from digging around leading up to this conversation. But for people who may not be familiar with your work, if you could just go ahead and introduce yourself in your own words and talk about how you got into making these type of videos. OK, um, so it started at a very young age. I think I was about two or three years old playing in the garden, barely able to kind of crawl properly and, and looking at wood lice under logs. And I remember that as kind of, you know, that key moment when I realized, wow, there's all this cool stuff out here in nature. And I just became obsessed with it. I got a little older. I started watching David Attenborough's documentaries on the telly and it blew my mind, you know, seeing the kind of sprawling ecosystem you've got in um, countries that felt so far removed. And yet it, it's not that far away. And you think that everything's kind of um, working together in this kind of global biosphere. And it just made me really want to do what he does, which is to create documentaries, to uh, present, narrate, get out in the field, if at all possible, and share the wonders of wildlife with people in the hopes that I could maybe have that same impact that he had on me, but on other people. So I made my first video when I was um, nine or 10 years old. It was about hermit crabs. My brother, who was five years older, and a bit of a tech genius, he filmed, uh, did the editing, and I wrote the script and narrated. And we never expected it to go far. We thought, oh, this is a bit fun, you know. I'm always um, kind of annoying my family members by talking to them about random animal facts, so why not do it to the internet? <laughs> and we didn't get that many viewers. It, it took a very long time and um, quite a few videos. In fact, it was only a couple of years ago, uh, looking back now, when everything started to take off. And the kind of turning point was I started to focus on the deep sea, just because one day I became fascinated by it. I think I saw a video by OceanX on YouTube where a scientist called John Copley, who is actually now one of my lecturers at university, which is very oh, exciting. Wow. Um, he went down in a submersible to the deep sea floor in Antarctica and they uncovered this unique ecosystem that had never been properly explored. It's still not fully understood. You've got giant marine invertebrates exhibiting gigantism because of the oxygen temperature hypothesis. And you've got, you know, abundant oxygen in the water there because it's colder and things like that. And it just blew my mind. And I thought, I've never seen anything like this. I am fascinated. So I did some more digging, found out some more about the deep sea, put together a little film about Greenland sharks. Um, because I, I thought they were incredible. They can grow to be 500 years old. They've got incredibly slow metabolism, parasites in the eyes, things like this. Just these <laughs> works that you don't get in many you know, animals that you see typically on documentaries or in your back garden. And from there, I made a few more videos and it really seemed to draw people in. And I think it's because it filled a niche on YouTube and even perhaps wider than YouTube that wasn't being filled, which is up and coming deep sea science being communicated in a way that's understandable, that's engaging, and that isn't kind of, uh, I'm not sure, kind of like just the only the only resources out there at the moment for that kind of stuff is hour long dive recordings that are uploaded to YouTube by the marine exploration organizations. And if you want to see cool stuff, you can sit through those, but you're going to have a hard time kind of staying awake and waiting for something exciting to happen because a lot of the deep sea is just you know, the abyssal plain, this expanse of sediment and poo that's settled on the bottom. And every now and then a whale carcass and some Greenland sharks and you know, things like that. So I wanted to take that footage, composite it in a way that's engaging and can highlight the wonders of this ecosystem. And people responded to that. So here I am kind of now on a podcast, which still is kind of, uh, you know, blowing my mind a bit that it even, <laughs> even 
watched, so thank you for having me. But yeah, that's a little bit about how I got here. Yeah, well, first of all, of course, you're very, very welcome. And as I said, I've been hoping to have this conversation for a while. And I think you're, you are the first guest that I've gotten the chance to speak to with a specialty in, in marine biology or anything even close to the topic. So it's very exciting for me. So th there's a lot of things to unpack there. First of all, uh, in general, how did you sort of make the shift to focusing on marine life? I mean, it sounds like it came just from your own personal interest before it became sort of relevant to the channel. Yeah, it was just purely, I, I've always loved the oceans, especially. I think even as a kid, even though I was obsessed and I'm obsessed with kind of all of the biomes, all the ecosystems and, you know, the big ones like elephants and lions and things like that. There was something about the ocean that just drew me in. Just the idea that it's this place where physics plays by completely different rules and kind of, I don't know, you can have something as large as a blue whale and as small as a clownfish and yet somehow you can find ways in a sentence to link you know their this to, to sort of link you know how they interact with each other and and it's just this one giant ecosystem broken down into lots of little completely different parts i'm, I'm not sure it's just it just blew me away the sort of diversity of it and i wanted to see it i wanted to be able to dive and and look at these places and of course recently when the deep sea kind of became an interest of mine. That was sort of my calling to start making videos about that because it had been a few years since I'd done a proper video and I wasn't finding much inspiration or I'd grown kind of out of the point where I could just stand in front of a green screen and people would watch it because it was cute. And I, I wanted to do something a little more professional. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that was the moment that it was kind of like, this is something really interesting. This isn't just a rehash of rhino facts or lion facts. You can get that you know, on David Attenborough. You can rewatch Africa this is something new. And that's why that's kind of become the focus since then. And where do you get a lot of the footage for your videos? Because I recognize some here and there, but is that all publicly available? Or are you reaching out to researchers to get access to some of this? It's sort of a mix of both. So um, you have some uh, places like NOAA, NOAA, um, who all of their footage is public domain. You can use it in anything kind of like NASA, because of course, it's, it's state funded. And in America, that's one of the most amazing laws they have is if it's state funded, any of the footage and resources can be used by anyone. Then there's other marine exploration organizations like Schmidt Ocean Institute, who I have contacts there and they're more than happy for me to use their footage. I've even done a direct collaboration with them about their new ROV technology and some of the new sampling methods, which was fascinating. Um, sometimes I will use a clip and I, I won't be too sure whether it's public domain, like it'd be from Embari. And I'll try and reach out because I don't know, they're quite a large company, they won't reply. So I'll kind of go under the assumption that it's covered by fair use since it, I'm transforming it and putting it into context in a video rather than say just re-uploading their video or like a their dive recordings. It's more, you know, compositing it into something that's different. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of a real mix. I'll write the script and uh, research, yeah, research, write the script, record, and then I'll just kind of go, right, what footage is out there that I can link to this yeah, the science, and then I'll composite it all and try and make something out of that. It's been pretty amazing how much footage seems to be available to you, and especially because I also, uh, this leads in nicely to sort of the next question. One thing, of course, I want to talk about at length is uh, the deep ocean. And it seems I've always been surprised when you make videos covering covering topics that are broadly about the deep ocean. You still seem to have a lot of footage, and I'm sure some of that is is actually not from the deep ocean. But how much how much is available on that front? Honestly, a lot more than I thought at first, because I was a little worried when I was kind of digging myself into the niche of deep sea videos that I'm going to run out so fast. You know, there's only so many topics, only so many ecosystems, you know, hydrothermal vents, brine pools, what else is there? But then the more you kind of dig into it and sort of the the more you research these topics, you realize there's this whole other world and there's a rabbit hole here and a rabbit hole there. And it opens up and you'll you'll search one thing into you know, the internet's trying to find footage for it and you go, oh, oh, there's nothing. And then there's this one tiny niche keyword you add and suddenly these sort of hundreds and hundreds of videos, maybe with one or two views from a, some scientist that's uploaded them. Or some, oh my God, I didn't realize they'd found this out. Like I, I did a video on whale falls and I thought, that's interesting. That's one of the only large food falls I imagine they've filmed. And then I was doing a little research into wood falls, which again, there's not much footage for. And it led me down a rabbit hole and I found this clip of um, a dead manta ray in the deep sea being devoured in the same way as as whales are but fascinatingly somebody's written an article about this the guy who'd recorded it called dr craig r mclean 
and he said that they observed that the fish don't like this as much as the whales because it's <laughs> so much cartilage it's really tough it's not mm. it's to eat but of course in the deep sea you can't be that choosy so they noticed that the sedimentation rate of something like that or similarly there was footage of a, a whale shark um it was decomposing. The sedimentation rate is much slower. You've got a slightly different community of animals there. And I was able to kind of craft that into a, a video about food falls in general, touching upon um, wood whale falls. And then these kind of more niche, lesser known examples of, of decomposition in the deep sea being, you know, fascinating as it is. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. And, you know, one thing you hear so regularly is, and I don't know, I'm sure this is sort of just a general statement. I don't think it's too accurate, but we know more about our own solar system than we do the ocean. And I think we have about 80% of the ocean is still unknown. And thankfully, in the last several decades, it seems clear that there's been a lot of work to developing the type of robotics, essentially, to go down there and probe further. So how much work are we making on that front at the moment? Well, uh, surprisingly, quite a lot. Already, the, the phrase that 80% is unknown is... Yeah, that's not true anymore. It's significantly, that's good. which is amazing. And that's just in the last, say, 30 years or so. There have been huge advancements in the technology. There have been, there's been a huge push, particularly uh, on the environmental front and from the UN and things like that, to have a focus for a decade on ocean science and things like this. So everybody seems kind of united in this, this um, approach to exploring the oceans and in particular the deep sea, because I found that every time you have um, something about the oceans that you want to understand or there's, a, you know, science is unraveling relating to the oceans. It always links to the deep sea because most of the ocean is deep sea. It's categorized as anywhere under 200 meters. So you can't really look at anything to do with the ocean in isolation as just, you know, the non deep sea, the shallow waters. You have to you have to understand how everything plays together, how you've got, you know, the mixing between the layers when it comes to nutrients, the migrations when it comes to the animals. And things like that so yeah um there's been a big push uh particularly with the marine exploration organizations whose footage i'm able to use they are the ones really pioneering this stuff and, and like i said i did a video with schmidt ocean institute two new sampling methods one is this kind of almost like a 3d laser scanner and it it moves across an organism and it allows them to create basically a 3d model of the external and internal structures and you can create a digital holotype so in the past these kind of drifting, gelatinous, uh, amorphous animals that are so hard to sample, or if they're easy to sample, they kind of melt when they get to the surface because of the pressure change. Suddenly, you can have a virtual holotype of them, which makes describing new species so much easier, which is, of course, great in an environment where you're always discovering new species. So things like that, which you just can't imagine unless you think about the specific context of the deep sea and what you need in order to advance our understanding there are being done. It's not getting talked about a lot. Uh, I, I remember being told by my contact at Schmidt Ocean Institute that they had an amazing revelation with their technology. And yet, because at the same time they filmed a tiny glass octopus that went viral. The media was talking about the octopus. It's not that exciting I've seen them hundreds of mm -hmm. times, but art article after article about, oh, look at this see-through octopus in the deep sea. And they're like, oh no, we wanted people to focus on the technology. Missed the the point, yeah. Exactly. And that does seem to happen a lot, but of course, um, the media will only really focus on things that will sell or be clicked. And despite how fascinating the rest of it is, there's no kind of appeal to that, sadly, even though I think there should be. Well, I think that's some of the benefit of the work that you're doing is just bringing in and, and making that appeal. I, I wish it would have been sort of more organic, I guess, but thanks to content creators like you, I think that a lot more people are taking an interest beyond the, ooh, it's a cute octopus or some strange other type of cephalopod or something. Yeah, that's yeah, true. So the one question I had is with, uh, maybe it's not 80%, regardless of the percentage, a huge portion of the ocean is still unexplored. And, you know, that begs the question of, of what else, what might we find in terms of marine life? Although I imagine that there is a much higher density of, or a much larger biodiversity closer to the coasts. So can we expect that to drop off quite a bit as we move deeper? Um, well, interestingly enough, that kind of view that the deep sea is less biodiverse or you've got kind of a, a lesser concentration of animals, um, it, it, it's, it's something that is we've time and time again, this research has disproven and it's just the complete opposite. Wow. 
And in fact, one of the very, very first theories relating to the deep sea called the Abyssus theory, I can't quite recall who came up with it, but um, it stated that everywhere below a certain depth, you could find no life at all, none, nothing. And it was kind of similar to the ideas that, oh, beyond our atmosphere, no life, because we don't know anything. <laughs> and they mm-hmm. thought, oh, pressure's too great, uh, it'll be too cold, there aren't enough nutrients down there, why would anything live down there? Why would anything adapt to survive those conditions when they've got coral reefs and surface waters? But then, of course, the Challenger expedition, they do a trawl of the deep sea and they find all sorts and just completely new animals from, from known phyla that look just so unfamiliar and so alien-like and that kind of that mission the challenger expedition where they did those trawls that is what kind of opened up all of the deep sea exploration that came afterwards because they knew now that there's stuff down there there's ecosystems down there that we we want to understand and i think i could be wrong um but off the top of my head i think it was in this in the 70s when they first discovered hydrothermal vents and of course they are now one of the most um you know, well understood, well known deep sea ecosystems. You've got these chimneys of deposited metal where superheated water from um, beneath the surface comes shooting out mineral rich fluids. You've got chemicals in there that support chemosynthetic life living around the vents. So uh, riftier tube worms and, and shrimps and crabs that grow bacteria in these sort of hairy mats on their bodies. You know, this crazy ecosystem where, where you don't find these animals anywhere else because they're so specialized to those conditions. And so, yeah, it, it it begs the question, what else is out there? If you've got something like that, that kind of runs along most of the, uh, most of the sort of continental margins in the ocean, that is bustling with life that we can't find anywhere else, there must be other stuff out there. Because we haven't mapped the entire seafloor. We're mapping it now. We're getting there. But there's still so much left to do that there is so much kind of breadth where we could find new things on that scale and that is what is so exciting about the deep sea and why i love it so much is that it is the last and i mean the last frontier of true exploration on planet earth we've discovered all the forests you know the amazon you're not going to find something new in there you, the, it is the last place where you can truly say there is an unknown and whatever it is it's going to be exciting and that's that's what gets to me couldn't agree more. And there, that's simultaneously very exciting and very sad because it's sad to see that last frontier slowly close. I mean, we have, I guess, maybe 50 to 100 years more of proper exploration. The The other thing is that what strikes me as so remarkable about how much we have left to explore is it seems to me the it's the, the marine biology equivalent of we know that there's a ton of life on the moon or perhaps a little bit farther, let's, let's say Mars, and, and astronomers just sort of really taking their time you know, like with so much, it, it, what else does a marine biologist want to do than, than go to every corner of the ocean and look for life? And when you know it's there, I'm surprised it's taken as long as it has to get to. Well, that's the problem is space exploration. This is, this is what I'm facing. Space exploration is easier than ocean exploration. Yeah. You can point a telescope into space and you can see, you know, millions of light years away and you can, you can, you know, you can work out kind of the composition, the mineral composition of a planet in, you know, know, millions of galaxies away on the other side of the observable universe. The ocean, you point the telescope at the ocean, after a few meters, it's gloom. It's just, you know, it absorbs all the light and you have to go down there. So they have to send these robots down or the submersibles, which is expensive uh, because you have to do it from a ship, which is also expensive. You have to have the crew. You have to train up people to pilot the ROVs remotely. It's such a delicate procedure. And even when you're down there with these ROVs, with the you know proper intense torch beams illuminating the depths, you can still only see about five meters in front of you because, again, all the light gets swallowed up or is thick with um, marine snow, the detritus falling from above. So... There's so much that stands in the way of ocean exploration being easy. And so there are these companies and they are out there, you know, whenever they can with these cruises and these missions. Um, Schmidt Ocean Institute, for example, I'll mention them again because they, the scale at which they do it, they're only really able to do it because they're funded quite well by um, a a philanthropist who set it up. And even then there's limitations. So you kind of, it's, it's kind of, there's always got to be, um, at least for the ones that are, say, state funded, there has to be incentive, which is how anything works. It all, you know, either comes down to money or politics. And and, uh, in my opinion, the, you know, wherever there's money available, it should be put into that if it can, because it's always going to be important. 
And one of the kind of upsetting things is the only reason there's really been such a push to explore the deep sea in recent years is because mining companies are interested in it. And so both the mining companies are interested in exploring the mineral resources down there and the scientific institutions are interested in um, finding out what the impacts of that mining would be and what ecosystems are down there that are threatened by that. So there's this kind of race in a way, but to, to kind of, I don't know, it's, it's in limbo at the moment because you've got um, things like the ISA, the International Seabed Authority that have, um, that say that you can only do, do kind of explorative missions now with regards to mining. There's, you know, it's everything's kind of on pause and yeah, and they've found, of course, that any mining in the deep sea is going to ravage these communities. You've got nodules, um, polymetallic nodules, which grow around pieces of detritus on the seafloor, like shark's tooth or bones. And they're kind of these like rocks of pure metal that uh, settles out of the water. And they're incredibly valuable for things like electric cars, for mobile phones and a future of sustainable technology for us humans. But of course, the machines that would be harvesting those would roll along the seafloor, churning it up, kicking up plumes of sediment that are going to clog the gills of fish, completely obliterate any of the gelatinous midwater organisms. They're going to be pumped to the surface and the pumps are going to generate enormous amounts of noise that are going to disturb whale migrations. Um, and then, of course, the nodules themselves, because they're hard surfaces and anything that has a hard surface on the seafloor, on the abyssal plain, is a vital attachment point for sessile animals. So, you know, the corals, your crinoids, um, your, your sponges that need something to attach to. They can't just live on the sediment and they can't move around. They're going to be ravaged as well. Their habitat's going to be lost. And if you say, you could say, oh, well, we'll only do it, you know, in this area. Well, say you've got a region of nodules here that, ex that extends to here and you ravage this part but in the interest of getting these minerals, well, then you've cut out a wildlife corridor. The animals can't get from there to there. It's the same with, you know, hedgerows in the countryside. There's just so much that we need to understand about the impacts of that kind of operation before they can even think about doing that. And that's why there's such a push. So it's kind of sad that the only incentive for, one of the only incentives for marine exploration at the moment is to either explore the possibility of exploiting it or explore the impacts of exploiting it. But yeah, that's even an even bigger can of worms in itself. But yeah, that's still quite interesting. Yeah, it, it really is a can of worms. One thing I was reading not too long ago, it wasn't actually in terms of mineral extraction, but it's sort of the looming sand shortage. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. A little bit. Where, yeah, so like for, for glass and particularly cement, uh, especially with how much cement that the, the developing world is in, anticipated to use over the next hundred years, we actually can only use min marine sand for sediment because if we go to the Sahara or something, you need the uh, sort of the wear of the the smoothing of the rock. I can't quite find the right words for it at the moment. Cement with the right properties. So what they've been doing is mining sand off the coast of Scotland, off the coast of different countries in Southeast Asia, um, a few particular places around the world, and. Initially, they said, you know, what's the harm? Nobody's using the sand. There isn't a lot of marine life. But you take sand from one place in the ocean and, you know, several hundred kilometers away, the entire seafloor begins to shift. So there's even there's cascading impacts of all of this type of, of resource extraction. But beyond the sand question, do you know what type of what are they looking for? So, so perhaps lithium or is it palladium? What type of metals are they looking to extract? I think it's yeah, typically like uh, lithium, rare earth metals. So things like lithium. Okay. Coal, okay. Uh, manganese uh mm. these you know can be used in batteries and, and sustainable tech even though the extraction process it's ironic isn't it <laughs> yeah that's the thing though people would be okay with it because it's out of sight if you were stripping the amazon in the interest of creating electric cars people would be like hang on maybe don't do that that's <laughs> yeah that. but when you're stripping up an ecosystem that very few people know about um, nobody really cares about. You can't see it. It's all the way down there at the bottom of the ocean. I'm never going to, you know, how's it benefiting me? But it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And it does benefit people because the entire biosphere, particularly of the oceans, is so interconnected. There isn't an isolated deep sea. It's just far away, but it's linked in every single way. It plays a role in sequestering carbon, which, of course, helps mitigate, you know, anthropogenic climate change and things like that. But that's already kind of under threat. You've got... Um, more layering of the oceans and so less mixing so more of the carbon stays at the top and goes back into the atmosphere but again that's something else um 
So, yeah, people need to realise that these ecosystems may be far away, but they're so important, not just for biodiversity, but for the entire cycling and the future of the planet as it is. It, everything plays a part. So I think if people understood more about these ecosystems and about the threats that, they're fa that uh, are facing them and, you know, the whole kind of a lot of the stuff to do with mining is very um, politically driven at the moment and it's all driven by money and you've got people's, people not wanting to kind of accept that there would be certain impacts because, of course, they've already invested millions into the machines that are going to go down there and extract them. And you've got at this point uh, one company called Impossible Mining that has devised a, a completely new architecture for how they could extract the, module, the nodules. And what it is, is rather than a big hulking machine that drives across the bottom, churning up the nodules and kicking up dust, it would be a sort of cylindrical drone-like thing that moves down, hovers above the seafloor, has uh, sensors looking down and a camera that can detect nodules that don't have animals living on them. It will pick it up, store it, pick, it up, pick up another one, store it, leaving behind nodules in a specific pattern. So you've always got a certain coverage on the seafloor and then it will rise to the surface and it won't kick up a single grain of sediment. Uh, I mean, there'll be a little bit, but you know what I mean? Uh, there's no pumps leading up to the surface and it could do that. And that would be brilliant. That way you can get these minerals whilst causing as, as little damage as possible to the seafloor ecosystem. But they just need to work out how to get um, the issue of buoyancy to work, but they're very close, I've heard. Uh, but the people who've already invested in the, the dredging machines they don't want to hear about it because they really, yeah, they don't care. Yeah, and that's, that would mean that all their money that's been put into these machines in the hopes that they get to use them will be down the drain. But if this company can prove to the ISA that it can be done, that it can be done without these dredging machines that cause so much damage, the ISA by law will have to say, OK, because we know that it can be done this way, the dredging machines are illegal. Because that, the ISA has an authority both to explore the possibility of the exploitation and to make sure these ecosystems are stewarded. They've got kind of two very opposing roles that they have to take care of. <laughs> and yeah, they, there's this real rush now to prove that it doesn't need to be the dredging machines. That technology is 30 years old. There are better ways that we can do it. And, and we should, because of course we want those ma materials. And if we can get them sustainably, why not? Then we can progress humanity on the surface and, and do all sorts and, you know, slow climate change and things like that. So that's just another element of it that I think is quite interesting. Yeah, the, the the whole subject is so amazing. And as you said, I think it really does just come down to visibility because I think the oceans are similar to space in that everybody loves them. Everybody spent a night on a on an Attenborough documentary or something of the sort just looking at it, watching angler fish or whatever, you know, whatever type of cephalopod has to happens to cross their screen. It's uh going going back to the question of what we might find in the deep oceans. Are there any thoughts? Is there anything we've really we really hope to find, I suppose, that that we might expect to? Oh, I'm not too sure. I I don't know what the kind of I haven't really looked into the say speculative uh sure. biology or speculative geology uh there is relating to the deep sea because every time something is discovered down there, it's just so strange. A surprise. <laughs> yeah, nobody dreamt it up. Um, you've got, they found um, not too long ago, Noah was, uh, had detected from a ship sonar what they thought was a wreck of, of, I don't know, some kind of ship or submersible. They went down with an ROV and it was this strange sort of flower-like structure and they dubbed it um, eventually a tar lily when they found out what it was. But it was this sort of hardened ooze of asphalt, or asphalt it kind of come oh. out from the, from under the surface of the ocean, which is, of course, a type of coal seep and any kind of hydrocarbon seepage is called a coal seep. And, but it, they'd just never seen one that had this kind of structure or was material this viscous. But it was incredible. And of course, it was supporting life because where there's hydrocarbons, you've got the possibility of chemosynthesis. So you had tube worms, you had um, corals living on the animals that are living on the bacteria that are living on the uh, hydrocarbons. So you had like this tiny little ecosystem in isolation and it was about, I don't know, it was smaller than a car, the whole thing. And yet there was an abundance of life. So things like that, it's almost impossible to predict really. So I have no idea. I'm sure people have theories, but yeah, whatever they find, I'm going to be excited. 
Sure. And and similarly, is there, maybe not specific to what we might find in the deep ocean, but is there sort of a holy grail of marine biology or a few of them? You know, in physics, you always talk about the, the unification of quantum quantum mechanics and relativity. And in each discipline, there seems to be this overarching big question. Is there something equivalent in marine biology? Oh, uh, I might have to think for a minute. But... The answer might be, I wouldn't be surprised if the answer is no to that one, because, you know, they're they're fundamentally different fields. But I was curious if there might be something that every researcher sort of has in the back of their mind, like, oh, I would love to love to know that. Ooh. I think you might be right that because it's such a different field that maybe there isn't that yeah. kind of central unifying um, grand theory that underpins everything. Um because it all links. That's what's different about it, I guess, is is uh, I think with physics, you can have systems in isolation. So the planets aren't going to be affected by, say, the physics that affects water in a way. Um, you know, they're affected by uh, tidal forces and gravitational forces and, and, and all of that. Or um, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of another good example. But with the oceans, it really does kind of link together everything at once because it's this one system whereas physics is more laws that underpin lots of different systems i guess but i know yeah. physics but i did very badly no no physics. worries <laughs> no worries and then so i also wanted to talk a little bit the in terms of chemosynthesis first question is what are your own thoughts about whether life was likely to have started in the ocean i think it's very likely i think you know, you see animals there that are able to be sustained by conditions that we once thought would be impossible to support life. And they're conditions that, in a way, mirror some of the conditions that we think were around on a very early planet Earth around the time that life was thought to be emerging. Um, and it's very possible that conditions like that were able to assemble the essential building blocks of life and give rise to animal life in the form of, you know, very basic uh, single cellular life that then, of course, once you have that, you have the scope to evolve and, and lead to entire communities of animals, you know, across you know the, the millions of years that you've had for that to happen. So I think it's very possible. There's a few theories, of course, you know, say that it comes from space or from lightning striking the mudflats uh, or just the sort of primordial soup in general. But I think it's very likely. And I think that that means that it could also be likely on um, Saturn's moons if, you know, they do discover that there are hydrothermal systems there. How exciting would that be to think that there could be some ecosystem underneath the ice that's similar but different, perhaps displaying convergent evolution, but a completely different, um, you know, domain of life on, on these moons. And that's that's what excites me. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how they can use some of these extremophiles in the deep ocean as sort of an analog for what we might love, find. And like you said, the moons of Saturn and farther afield in the universe. It's how long do you, how long have we known about chemosynthesis? I think it's only been 50, 60 years, maybe that we've we've understood that those processes. Yeah, I think something like that. And of course, with the hydrothermal vents being the first time they were properly kind of seen in situ and, and they realized the scope of the life it can support. Yeah. Um, for most of uh, human history, uh, especially, you know, the last few centuries, they haven't even entertained the possibility of something like that being around, which is why they thought with the abyssus theory that nothing could exist down there. You know, you need sunlight. Nothing can survive without sunlight. They thought you can't have primary production without sunlight. But of course, now we know you can. God, it's so amazing. I hope it's it's crazy. Both the frontiers of space and ocean exploration seem like they're about to enter a bit of a golden age. So at least we have a lot to look forward to over the next, you know, again, 10 to 20 years. Yeah, definitely. It's very exciting. I wanted to also at least briefly move away from the oceans because, again, your channel still does and your interests still are more broad across the natural world. And one thing that, in my opinion, gets really underappreciated, and admittedly, I'm a, I'm a little bit of an Anglophile, is the wildlife in the UK. Yeah. And I don't think people think of the UK as, as this special place naturally, but it really is all up and down all of the UK. So I was just curious, what, what are your own thoughts about your home country's nature and what are some of your favorite places? To me, the wildlife of the UK is as exciting as the deep sea. And I've been working on a series in the New Forest, which I, I live very near 
It's this sort of almost untouched ancient woodland, very big, and it's full of wildlife. You've got toads and frogs and deer and wild, semi-wild ponies um, and all sorts of birds and, and bogs and all the ecosystems kind of working together much in the same way as you get with the deep sea. And it's beautiful. And I've been going there for the last year and a half filming, uh, still kind of not ready with the films because there's just so much or I just want to get it just right that I'm always too scared to say that it's done. But yeah, um, it, it will always fascinate me. But what's sad is that despite its kind of unique and distinct beauty that, that you see with British wildlife, we are also one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. And most of our countryside, and you, you know, you, you picture the English countryside, you see nice sprawling fields and farmland and you think, yeah, most of our countryside is just that, fields and farmland. You know, the, the, the ancient woodlands, most of them are gone. Uh, the Lake District, which is one of, you know, it's one of the UK's biodiversity hotspots. Even that, most of that is plantation, conifers, trees that aren't supposed to be here, don't in any way support UK biodiversity. They turn the soil uh, acidic. And, you know, th there's that all over it, to, to such an extent that you need proper mass scale rewilding projects in order to sustain the wildlife of this little island. And there is um, an increasing focus on that at the moment, which is definitely good, but not to the scale that's needed. And a lot of our species are declining. I have never seen a hedgehog. Uh, I grew up in London. I despise London. Um, but <laughs> my friends who've lived anywhere else have said, you've never seen a hedgehog. I saw them all the time as a kid, as a kid. And I'd say, what about more recently? And they say, oh, no, not for you know, 10 years. And I go, that's tragic because yeah. you know, they talked about that they're, you know, that under threat, but they, they really are. Red squirrels are sort of pushed back to a tiny domain in the north or a tiny island called Jersey where there are no greys, which of course the greys came over from America and just wiped them out, outcompeted them. Um, and even in Scotland, you've got wildcat populations where most of their gene pool has been watered down by breeding with domestic cats. And it's got to the point where if they see a wildcat that has 75% um, wildcat DNA and the rest is domestic cat, they'll try and they'll like focus on that and they'll tag it and they'll be like, we'll treat this as one of the wild ones. And wow. it, it's, you know, there is kind of some things where we're at the point of no return, but other things it's crucial that we rewild uh, our government is not the best at that, but um, our governments haven't been particularly good at that for as long as I've been alive. So I have hope for the future and that there'll be, you know, a greater pressure on the government to steward these places and expand them because that's what's needed. But um, sometimes I get a little bit sad about the way that it's going and the way that our biodiversity is is declining in the UK, which is yeah, a bit tragic. Yeah. It seems across the world, governments definitely haven't been doing what they're supposed to. But as you said, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic just because I think it's tough to find people who are roughly our age who don't share these sort of sentiments, you know. And so long as that's the case, the government will change just how, how long and hopefully not. It's not going to be too late. That's true. And I certainly hope so. I do still, um, you know, talk to a number of people around my age who, who have the mentality that nature is gross or oh, keep it out, keep it outside or why are you touching that? Oh, look, it's a, it's a snake. It's a slow really? one. Yeah. And it upsets me because, you know, this is their world, especially if I'm, you know, taking somebody out to the woods and then they're seeing something go, oh, it's like, no, that's this is where it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're the ones that are kind of the, the disgusting ones here. I mean, look at the plastic pollution all around us. And there's a lot of plastic pollution in the new forest. Um, so that's the mindset that I hope also starts to change. Uh, and that people get more curious with nature, uh, especially at a young age. If I hadn't been out there lifting up logs, looking at wood lice or, you know, letting ladybirds poo on me and then getting curious <laughs> and looking at it and then being disgusted, you know, things like that, they connect you with it. They, they ground you in the natural world and they give you a fascination, a raw fascination. And that's something I think that has to be there from a young age in order for it to properly mean something. And in the UK, yeah, it's so easy to kind of foster that in young people as long as you as long as you do it as long as you know schools are doing that and and television and all the influences that they have as long as there is a focus on that you can have you know a generation that grows up loving the natural world i was very lucky that i had that mindset even at a time when it wasn't that say widespread um that, likewise with you i'm sure but yeah it's just it it's about environment it's about 
connecting with the natural world and it's about having an appreciation and understanding and a desire to protect it that we need to foster. Yeah, again, needless to say, I could not agree more. And that also brings me nicely into the next thing I want to discuss, which is one of my favorite videos of yours, the most crim maybe the most criminally underrated video of yours is The Whisper of the Woods. And was that filmed in the in the New Woodlands that you were just talking about in the New Forest? Rather? Yeah, that, yeah, it was. That was filmed in the New Forest with the same camera that I'm using for the well, I basically I, the footage from that I took from the same pool that I'll be taking for um for my for the longer series that I've been filming. Um, so it's nice. very similar visually, but I wanted to get something out there in the meantime while I worked on that. National Poetry Day came around, and I thought, why not? You know, I put um, a yeah. great poem, a sentiment of look at look at you know the biodiversity loss, the plastic pollution here. You know, when are we going to do something about it? What impressed me is as I was watching that video. I sort of went into it expecting sort of one of more your your more traditional videos. And as you were providing the commentary, I had to check whether this was like a Robert Frost poem or something that had been that you had writ you had just read on top because the prose itself was fantastic, really. So are are you planning to do more artistic type of videos like that? I definitely hope to. Um alongside nature, one of my longest running passions has been writing, whether that's you know, short stories, stories, poems, things like that. Uh, so it was really fun to be able to integrate that into a video on the channel in a way that I knew, you know, there'd at least be some audience for it because the channel's got a following. Definitely nowhere near the the views that Deep Sea Ones get, but I didn't care. It was fun and some people seem to enjoy it. Um, so in any way that I can kind of sneak that in in the future, I'll definitely try to, for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely be one of the people most looking forward to it. And it's a shame that sort of the more you ask people to think in the videos, the less people who will who follow along. Yeah. So yeah, I guess as a science communicator, you got to strike that balance between providing people information, but not too much to the point that they're not going to, they're going to grow apathetic. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of balance is something that always weighs on my mind when I'm making a video, which is, I want to entertain people. I want to engage people. In some cases, I want to, you know, relax people. But I also want them to learn something and I want them, even if at the very least, because I know some of the deep sea films can be quite in-depth or the scientific content can be quite heavy or there'll be words that I'll kind of assume people know because I've said them in previous videos and I don't want to have to do a definition for everything every time. Otherwise, it would be you know two hours long. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm aware and even from comments I've read that some people tune out for what's being said. But they say, but they're still present and, and they find it relaxing or they'll have it on the background or they'll sleep to it or just the whole aesthetic they like. And for, to me, that's kind of enough because it says that people are, you know, either engaged enough or interested enough in being in that kind of space where, you know, you've got the, the deep sea footage and things like that. And, and you can kind of tune in and out of the narration and perhaps learn one or two things. That to me is still, you know, amazing, in my opinion, that people are wanting to do that about something that is quite niche, uh, isn't that well known. You know, people typically are drawn to the deep sea historically for ideas to do with the Megalodon still existing or, you know, monsters down there or Lovecraftian lurking mm -hmm. in the depth. And perhaps that's what makes people click when they see deep sea, but the fact that they stay for the science and for the animals down there that are just as fascinating as anything Lovecraft could write about, even if they're not gonna end the world, that to me is just fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It's. I was just going to ask, it's funny you bring that up because I've spoken to a lot of uh, space specific channels and they say that a huge portion of their audience are sleeper viewers in the sense that, you know, they'll catch 15 minutes, they're engaged for those little bit before they fall asleep and then they sort of just go through the playlist overnight. So it sounds like you have a lot of the similar feedback. Yeah, definitely. And it's something that I've never been insulted by. I personally, I... Oh, yeah. The last I've been putting on um, Brian Cox's series, The Planets. To say to <laughs> yeah. It. Using, I, you should definitely watch it. They did an American remake with a different narrator. I haven't seen that. Uh, Wouldn't Brian trust Cox, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Brian Cox, his voice and the way that he explained things and the way he's able to kind of just walk along a beach, pick up five different sized rocks and explain to you the way that the solar system works and you understand it, I find incredible for sure. Also, before I forget, one of the other things is I, I kind of assumed you had grown up somewhere more directly in the countryside, not in London. So how did you get your nature fix in London? Just hop over to Hyde Park at every opportunity or would you where, where would you typically go? 
I did spend a lot of time in specifically Hyde Park as a kid. <laughs> okay. And Richmond Park, where you've got red deer and, and sort of wild heathland. But it was really sort of a repulsion to London that made me love wildlife so much. And that as a kid, you know, somebody living in the countryside, you could when you're six or seven years old, you can go outside and play around in a field and do what you want and come home for tea. Me, step outside, it's a main road. It's there isn't <laughs> yeah. there's no there's no uh, you know, room for the imagination to, to run wild run wild or you can't just go outside and play and, and and so every time that I did get to be in the countryside or anywhere there was wildlife, say if we did a holiday or we visited family, because I've got family, you know, in different parts of the country, um, it would just be the best. And I would fall in love with wherever it was. And I remember when I was six or seven writing little stories on an iPod touch that I had, um, you know, before they had cameras and you could, before you could change the home screen. And I just typed these little stories about living in the countryside Um and so, yeah, it was just sort of a love that blossomed from a hate for London and, and the joy I felt being in nature. But to this day, I, I hate London. Um, I appreciate it as a place to visit. I appreciate it as a, a place for tourists. And I'll go back and I'll, I'll have a nice time. But it's, it is this sort of bustling manifestation of everything I hate about humanity. And, and, and people have no time for you. You sort of you say hello to a stranger and you'll probably get sectioned. It's just, it's not, it's not very welcoming, whereas the woods always have been, in my opinion. No, I, I certainly understand that. And how are you, I hope you have better feelings about Southampton. It's because of its size, it's very small, at least to me. Uh, and I can get a train, I can walk two minutes, get a train. Ten minutes later, I'm in the middle of the new forest. What more could I want? And then I've still got this sort of convenience of being in a city and, um, so yeah, I'm 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 fond of Southampton. It's not beautiful. It's incredibly industrialised. There's no beach, even though it's right on the sea. Uh, your view over the water is an oil refinery and, uh, and rubbish treatment or whatever. Um, but it's the be the best place in in the country, if not in Europe, to study marine biology. They have um, the university has a waterfront campus called the National Oceanography Centre that is half inhabited by real world marine scientists and half inhabited by the university. So you've got ROVs there. You've got um, really famous marine vessels like uh, James Cook and Discovery. Um, it's just incredible. There's, there's nowhere else on earth where you can kind of be at the center of up and coming marine science and get involved with it. And, and your lecturers are uh, in there in their, when they're not lecturing, they're out there discovering the stuff that they're then coming back and teaching you. And it's, you know, fundamental, incredible stuff. Like I said, John Copley, Dr. John Copley, who is a, a deep sea ecologist who was in the video that very first inspired my love of the deep sea. He teaches me about the deep sea in lectures and it's, it's amazing in a way. Um, uh, yeah, but it's just this kind of incredible place for that. So that helps me overlook the, the fact that uh, a lot of the time it could be sort of a dingy little industrial city at the tip of England, at the bottom edge of England. But yeah. And, and why why Southampton of all those of all places? How has that become a hub for marine biology? I, I'm not too sure. It could be um, the sort of the fact that it's always been a sort of port city. It's where the Titanic set sail from on the sort of ill-fated voyage. So you you have the infrastructure there. The Oceanography Centre, I think, is on the exact place, pretty much where Titanic set sail from. So you you've got the port infrastructure. You've got the sort of um, yeah, it's the access to the sea. It's not too far from London, so um, that's always good for, for things in this country. Anywhere that's sort of too far away from London to get to gets sort of forgotten about and falls into a bit of disrepair because the government is the government as it is. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just that. And in a weird way, that means the sort of industrialization of it helped cement it as a place for science and seagoing research. And that's just how it came to be because it's not. The marine ecosystem near Southampton is not, it's by no means the sort of best in England. You've got places like Falmouth and Plymouth where it's slightly warmer waters and you get dolphins and sharks and, and sometimes turtles. So, you know, here we get sort of clams and the odd fish, but it's, it's the gateway to the ocean. And yeah, it's just sort of evolved like that, I think. Mm -hmm. And further related to the, your, your university experience, I think there's a lot of people who might have been in your position who would have just omitted their university experience and gone straight to, you know, 
further commercializing, I suppose, the your brand. So how, how has university changed your interest, your direction? Are you more inclined to be a researcher when you're done, or is it just further equipping you to make this type of content? That's a very interesting question, because it's something that weighs on my mind a lot, is mm -hmm. sometimes I'm thinking, why am I here when I could pursue something, you know, a career in, in science communication, but then other times I think, well, I don't want to burn down bridges to potentially being in research. Um, John Copley, for example, who I'm so inspired by, I would, you know, love to do what he does, which is out there on boats, you know, discovering things to do with the deep sea and, and pioneering research. I'd love to do that. So if I can use university as a way to both do that and still be involved in science communication, uh, then that would be a dream come true. The dream would be creating documentaries or narrating or presenting them, but also being in the field and ideally involved in the research, which is not something I think I'll achieve. I think they'll become sort of a, a fork in the road where I'll either have to choose or, or which one at least to prioritise. Um, but I guess there's also the perpetual fear of just what if YouTube doesn't work out? What if, um, you know, for some reason everything crumbles and, and you know, I, I don't have the sort of traction to keep going with that, then university is a nice backup. And of course, you've got the perks of kind of the student life and everything like that, which is very nice. No, it's certainly fun. At the very least, it's, it's an enjoyable few years. And for what it's worth, I mean, the this whole podcast, the whole operation is peanuts compared to what you've built thus far. But for what it's worth, I think I've only personally been able to have a lot of the conversations I've had because I come with the my educational background. I think it's, it's, it's silly, but the reality is people still don't tend to take you too seriously beyond a certain point without the degree. So I definitely think you're making the right decision. And then it's that much more content to be exposed of for uh, an endless list of future videos by the end of it. That's very true. There's definitely the odd thing in a lecture where I'll just go, right, I'm having that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and definitely. have you uh, a bit of final note sort of on the UK? Uh, so I did a semester at the University of Edinburgh. And from that point on, have just been obsessed with Scotland and every, everything Scotland, particularly the wildlife. Have you had a chance? Because I've, I've talked to so many English people who have not made it up in their life. Have you had the chance to go up there? Once. And it Once. was university for a field trip or a field course. Oh, cool. So we spent um, around a week on the island of Great Cumbrae uh, near mm. the Firth of Clyde, I believe. And uh, we were studying coastal ecology, so looking at rock pools, intertidal ecosystem, things like that. And it was so diverse. It was one of the best rock pool ecosystems I've ever seen. So it, it really makes me hungry to explore more of Scotland. And of course, the architecture and the people and the whole culture up there is just incredible. So um, I hope to go back again and rectify the stereotype of Englishmen. <laughs> uh, and if I can, yeah. do films um, on the wildlife there if, if I'm able to. That, that would be very exciting. Mm -hmm. I should add the caveat that while I have talked to many pink English people who have not been up to Scotland, the University of Edinburgh feels like it's 80 to 90 percent people from England. So <laughs> it's a little bit of a paradox there. I also just a, a quick interesting aside, I on a on a trip to uh, horrific London down from from Edinburgh during my time there, I brought some Scottish pound. And everywhere I went, nobody would recognize it. Everywhere I would go, whether it's like an Itsu or a McDonald's or a nicer place, whatever it is, every person would go, is this, you know, are you are you taking the piss? Like, what's going on? And I would just be like, no, it's just, that's the money. So I found it, I was just surprised how disconnected it seemed to be. But yeah. unrelated, un unrelated aside. Um, one final uh, marine biology topic, I suppose, I want to make sure to get to just because it's, it's a personal favorite of mine. And I think of yours is deep sea gigantism. I just that was one of the first videos. One of your videos on the topic is one of the first videos I came across of yours. And I've gone back. That's if I show someone your channel, that's typically the video that I'll introduce just because it's it has it all. It's it just has everything that brings somebody to an interest in the ocean. I feel like that just checks every box. Just So for anyone who, who hasn't seen that video or isn't familiar, if you could just sort of run through that, that would be great. Okay, definitely. Uh, it was, uh, aside from some shorter videos on individual deep sea animals, it was the first kind of, you know, closer look, deep dive into a topic, you know, close, uh, nearing 10 minutes. Um, and I was just blown away by this topic. It's It basically is this tendency for animals in the deep ocean to grow 
to larger sizes than their shallow water counterparts. So you have it in things like Greenland sharks, where it's perhaps uh, less apparent because, of course, you do have some large shallow water sharks, but it's still there. And um, you've got it especially in the marine invertebrates. So say um, isopods like garden wood lice, they are one of the only truly land dwelling crustaceans. They're related to the ones that you get on beaches, you know, sort of little uh, shrimp like things. Um, in the deep sea, you get them, the giant isopod, which is nearing the size of a cat. You know, it's almost morphologically, it's almost the same, just blown up, you know, with some very, <laughs> and you get the same with amphipods. So like the little sand fleas you get jumping around when you move seaweed on the beach, the deep sea, nearing the size of a cat, super giant amphipod, Shella gigantia, I think. Uh, and yeah, you see this kind of time and time again across many different phyla in the deep sea. And they think that it is due to the sort of limited resources in the deep sea. So, so the low food availability in parts of the deep sea resulting in it being advantageous to be larger because you become more efficient, which kind of sounds paradoxical in itself. But when you break it down and think of think about concepts like surface area, the larger you are, I think the smaller, I always get this wrong, the smaller no the surface area to volume ratio is, I believe. Yeah. So that means that you've got a smaller amount of surface area per, say, unit volume of your biomass. And what that means is you're able to kind of retain more of the uh, energy, the, the nutrients that you take in, and less per gram is lost through, say, heat or just kind of lost to the environment through conduction. Um, and yeah, so it means that these animals, when they have slow metabolisms, so they're digesting slowly, they can rely on not necessarily very little food constantly because that would kind of be a bit more challenging to sustain a larger body it's more they can rely on huge feasts very rarely so you've got whale falls you know the when a, when a whale dies and sinks to the ocean floor these animals will assemble you know rapidly and feast on the flesh and whale falls are far more abundant than we think because they think that there may be one every like 10 or 100 kilometers on the seafloor um these animals can feast and then they might not have another one for a while but because of their slow metabolisms, they can sustain that. And that is what allows them to kind of be large because they can get that biomass inside of them. And then they can just rely on that for a little while. Uh, and in Antarctica and parts of the Arctic, you have something similar called polar gigantism, which takes it one step further, because I think I mentioned this briefly earlier. You've got these um, much colder waters. And of course, cold water holds more oxygen because um, you've got less kinetic energy moving the water particles. And when kinetic energy is moving around, the oxygen gets released to the atmosphere in warmer waters. Um, so here it's sort of locked in and you have this abundance of it. So the animals there can sort of evolve to be larger sizes because they aren't constrained. Their body size isn't constrained by limited oxygen. So you have pycnogonids or sea spiders, which in the rest of the ocean are about a, a millimeter uh, long. And in Antarctica, a very similar species um, called the Antarctic uh, sea spider. Actually, I can't remember the exact name, um, but an Antarctic pycnogonid, it can grow to the size of a dinner plate. And it's just, and it's able to do that because it doesn't even have a